Hello, Katie, and how are you? I am very well, thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm uh, I'm all talked out almost because I've had your friend Lydia on earlier in the day. Oh, I, I haven't. We haven't had like a really, really good long chat for a while now. So, I mean, we're always like messaging each other and you know but i haven't like sat down with her and had a good chat so i'm a bit jealous actually well that wasn't you... what i was going for but i'll take it <laughs> <laughs> oh she's so lovely yeah I love she's great with lydia she's great and you know she's got such a, a great take on the industry and such a great understanding of like you know how the industry's changing at the moment yeah and you know what's going to be necessary for artists in future so it was a really really good chat in general yeah no i love listening to her she does a lot of conferences as well and she's always really great to you know talking in front of an audience which can be hard for some people but she's really great at it yeah yeah she's amazing amazing Mm -hmm. yeah so good stuff so how is ibiza Ibiza is it's really strange time i mean just like everywhere else on the planet um we actually the island is totally closed right now they've closed the borders today um so nobody's allowed out or in Mm -hmm. um because we're getting a a lot more cases um it's strange it's really strange time i mean the island is really is as beautiful as ever it's 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 lovely but the, everything's closed. Everything's closed. Um, it's not really pe- a lot of people about on the streets. It's kind of sad, really. Um, and yeah, I mean, all we can do is just, you know, be as optimistic and positive as possible. Um, but yeah, it's been a strange year for the island, obviously, with everything that's going on. Um, obviously, Ibiza lives off tourism. And so it's going to. So let's see what happens. Let's see what happens this year. Mm. now i know what you mean it's uh it's pretty much the same here yeah. but uh you know it's it's i've found that like because this is like lockdown three or as i've been calling it lockdown three this time it's personal uh i've been giving them different names like lockdown two <laughs> was uh electric boogaloo electric <laughs> boogaloo <laughs> you know, just, just 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 to try and lighten the load just even a touch just you know a bit of a name yeah i know yeah <laughs> To be honest, this lockdown that we're, as I say lockdown, we're not totally locked down. We just have a curfew. So we have to, between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m., we always have to be at home. Um, we're not allowed out of the house. There's nowhere to go anyway. So that doesn't really make much of a difference. But our first lockdown that we had was crazy. Like we weren't allowed to leave the house at all unless it was essential and you had permission to do so, to walk a dog or to go to the supermarket or pharmacy. Um, and that, that was horrible because we weren't even allowed to leave the house to do exercise. So it was just, I, I can't even remember how long we were in it for. I think it was about, must be about six weeks or so. Mm. Or so. That was tough, especially on, you know, on your mental health. It was just like, I need some fresh air. I need to go for a walk. Um, I need to go for a run. And especially when you live like in, in a small apartment, it could be really tough. And we have neighbors was that had like that had two children under the age of seven and just think how that how do you do that you know so at least this time around we actually are allowed out the house um throughout the day so that makes a massive massive difference mm. um but yeah still weird with everything closed and just dead really yeah yeah i mean it's pretty much the same here i mean it's not a complete and full total lockdown like it was last spring but it's it's near as and you know i've noticed there's a lot of people here are really struggling because you know january yeah. in the uk is tough enough as it is do you know what i mean without all I of this know. happening on top and you know you're only supposed to go out for exercise once a day and stuff like that and you know it's there's really nothing else to do like nothing know, else is open that's it. You know, literally do you know what today I felt quite chuffed with myself because it's been the first time for like, I can't even remember the last time I've actually ticked everything off my to-do list. <laughs> like this never, ever, ever happens. I'm like, I obviously have no distractions and nothing else to do because I've got absolutely everything done today. And that is a very, very, very rare thing to happen. So 
I mean, I guess there's some good sides to it from staying at home. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Whereas I'm just organising just podcasts with people I absolutely love one after the other just to kind of get yeah. a bit of social contact. You're going to have a well sore throat later talking all this time. Oh, trust me, trust me. I can do this for England and have done on many occasions. Trust me, <laughs> trust me. I'm just getting, I'm actually just getting started to be honest with you. So oh, it's all right. Good. It's all good. It's very difficult to shut me off. Any, every, anyone knows me well knows that. Like, oh, Paul, will you shut up? You're talking over the moment, Paul. Shut up. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, obviously it's 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 weird old times, but, you know, also you've got to look at the positives, right? And, you know, apart from your, your to-do yeah. list being, uh, you know, completely completely done and polished off for the day, so you've got a clean weekend. Uh, you know, there's, there's yeah. a lot of good work going on, you know? There's obviously, uh, with everything that, you know, you're connected to with Hello Demo, which is super exciting and super interesting mm-hmm. which we can talk about and you know just what you're what you're working on in general basically because obviously i've already been on your rather wonderful podcast can you put me on guest list yeah. which yes was, you have it was lovely chat loves that yeah it was great it was really really good so obviously round two is here the uh, the the comeback uh, yeah. so to speak the rematch and uh, yeah it'd be good to kind of get a bit of a perspective on on your own journey in in the industry and where that's kind of taking you because obviously we met through the hello demo thing and that's kind of like sort of grown from there but like where where was yeah. your starting point in the industry and how did you find yourself sort of like in the electronic music industry and when did it happen give me everything Okay, so I was studying at university in Valencia and um, I studied journalism and communications Um, and the guy who was the head of marketing at Amnesia at the time is a very close friend of mine, he's called Isra Garfia Mm -hmm. Um, and I worked a lot with him, you know, just managing a few different social media accounts for him just for like a little bit of, of, of extra money when I was studying. And um, I think I was into like my second year at uni and he was like, I need somebody to come to Ibiza for three months over over the summer season to run our social media accounts. I was mm, 20. Yeah, I was 20 at the time. He was like, would you be interested in coming? I think I'd only been to Ibiza about once before. Um, and I was like, yeah, I'm there. Like, of course. Um, yeah. Hello. (laughs) So that's, that's what I did. I came over to, to Ibiza, um, found myself a little small room in Santa Eulalia, um, which was the only thing that I could afford. <laughs> and I started managing their social media accounts for the whole of Amnesia group because they had Cova Santa and then they had another co- couple of clubs uh, back in Barcelona as well. And once, I think I'd been there for about a month and a half or two months, they decided they wanted to open um, Amnesia's YouTube channel and wanted somebody that could speak English and Spanish to interview all of the artists and all of the DJs that played Amnesia. Now, my since I was about seven years old, I had always said that I wanted to get into presenting. Like that is that was like my life goal. Can you remember Cat Dealey? I remember. Oh, how do I remember Cat Dealey? Of course, I do. Cat <laughs> Dealey was. I think anybody, uh, you know, that was. Didn't was she you- marry Patrick Keelty? Yes. So uh... the, the the Irish guy. Yes, the, I yes. think so. So everybody says I look like Patrick Keelty. Really? Yeah. I can't even think what he looks like. I have to. Have a look. uh, he's he's way he's you. not he's not as good looking You're as looking me. At it. It's not as good, not good looking <laughs> as me. Like, few, fewer tattoos these days as well. To be fair, but I was yeah. actually listening to a podcast with her the other day. I hadn't like, obviously, well, I just hadn't seen her on TV for a very very long time, and then I came across a podcast, and I was like, oh wow, it feels like I'm going back to. You know, my younger years of listening to Kat Dealey. She still has the same voice as before, everything. Um, But anyway, yeah, so I was just like obsessed with Kat Dealey and I wanted to get into presenting when I was older. So when this opportunity came up and they asked me, would you want to, do you just want to do a trial and just see how it goes? So I was like, okay. Um, And they're like, okay, well then you're starting tonight. So your first interview tonight is Steve Aoki. He's going to be here at 1 a.m. and you're just going to have to interview him. And I was like, what? (laughs) just like that all of a sudden just got thrown in the deep end um so anyway so i did the interview 
went well uh i think if i look back on it now though i'd be like cringe um but yeah and then that so that started there and then every single night for the whole year and the next two following years i was at the club interviewing all of the different djs so that's where it all kind of started for me and um and then from there i did a lot of um work also presenting for um, I worked in DJ Mag and, um, from there I hosted the DJ awards in Ibiza, um, space Ibiza, Pasha. So I started getting into lots of, you know, online TV shows that are here in Ibiza, um, that were all electronic music based. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so that was kind of where it all began for me. And then I actually decided, I think I'd been here for about four years or so I got a job in Barcelona a production um, company it was called Media Pro and they were starting a streaming um, an on a streaming TV channel um, which was called Groovity TV um, and again it was you know interviews with DJs short documentaries live streams all that kind of stuff. So I went and worked over back in Barcelona for a year, but then I was like, no, Ibiza is definitely my place. Really missing Ibiza. Um, and then I got the opportunity to go and work at Ibiza Global Radio. Sorry. To work at <laughs> Ibiza Global Radio. Um, and I'd, I mean, I'd always wanted to, I loved presenting, but I, I'd always just thought I would just wanted to stick with TV. Um, and you know, like on anything like online TV as well. Um, and I was like, I don't know if I really want to do radio, but anyway, I'm going to give it a go. Let's see how it goes. And I just totally fell in love with doing radio. So I ended up, um, quitting everything else I was doing and going to work with Ibiza Global Radio for, for a full time. And I was there for four years. Um, and then on the side, whilst working at Ibiza Global Radio, I was, working you know with different clients at the same time in social media marketing and then that's where I started working with Hello Demo as well so that's just over a year ago now um and I actually did end work with, with Ibiza Global Radio at the beginning of this year there was a lot of internal situations and problems that were going on and I just didn't my just heart wasn't in it. My heart wasn't fully in it. So I thought, you know what, this is just, this for me means that it's the end um, and move on to the next chapter. So that was a very hard decision because also it was when COVID had just started and I was like, am I crazy? So, you know, quitting a job in the middle of everything that's happening, but it was definitely, definitely the right choice because I'm just not one of them people that can work half-hearted and just you know not fully have have my head there so um so I quit and then um about a month later Pasha were looking for somebody to start working with them as well full-time a Pasha group um and they were looking for somebody for copywriting and content creation so I took that on and so I'm working so currently I'm working with them um, at Pash Group and with Hello Demo, and then I think um, extra that comes along the way in podcasting or interviews or live Instagram videos and stuff like that. <laughs> Anything I'm thrown into. <laughs> you sound, honestly, you sound like me. Like the worst question you can ask me is like, "What, what do you, what do you do for a living?" I'm like, "Oh God." This is what I asked you, and you were like, right. uh, "Yeah, I remember where that now." Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how long does this podcast have to last? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I don't actually never really have an answer when somebody says to me, "What do you do?" And I'm like, "Well, I do different things." So um. normally, it's all in the kind of like content creation, mm, social media marketing, presenting kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's funny, is it? Because you always end up sounding absolutely like a wet lettuce saying all that stuff. Because you sound like, oh, so you're not you're unemployed then, basically. basically you don't, you don't yeah. sound like you don't you don't even sound like you know what you're doing. 
absolutely to anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like anything you know, anything that's thrown at me, basically. Well, yeah, basically. Yeah, basically. I think my, my default from in future for can't be bothered. Like I'm an Uber driver. Just let me leave me alone. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because all Uber de- Uber drivers are actually DJs. That's the that's the key. That's, like that, that's that, that's true. It was yeah. the worst thing. Like that's... I mean, the little aside. Like when I lived in LA, it was the worst thing you could do if you got into an Uber in LA because everyone was either a DJ or some sort of hip hop producer. So if you so said true. that you worked in the music industry, you would basically get an hour long Uber drive where they would yeah. go the long way round LA from one end of the city to the other just so they could play you their mixtape. That that exact same thing has happened to me before in LA as well. Oh, Literally. God, it's the worst. Literally. Honestly. And then it's like, let's uh, let's connect on Instagram. Let's talk, you know? The, let's do this let's do that here's my card take my number and i'm like i just literally just wanted to go to the supermarket <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly exactly i'm on my way home from ralph's with a bag yeah, full of shopping i don't want to listen to your demo like to be fair there's a time and a place for these things like you know all due all due respect i admire the hustle you know and that, that, that's just la in a nutshell though isn't it it's like everyone's it someone else like i remember the security guy in my apartment building was actually a screenwriter you know <gasps> I know, everybody. The, the, to, to be honest, the same as here in Ibiza, though. Everybody you talk to is a DJ. Mm-hmm. Everyone. In fact, I ordered, I had made a massive order on Ikea just before Christmas. And um, my parents were here because they spent Christmas here. And oh, I remember we were out walking the dog one morning. And the phone rang and they're like, oh, this is um, the delivery guy from Ikea. I'm just outside your house. I was like, okay, I'll be there in two minutes because I really wanted to get this stuff for Christmas. Day. Anyway, to so bring box up and then I sign and then literally 30 seconds later, I get a WhatsApp on my phone saying, hi, this is DJ Chris. I was your IKEA delivery guy. And I'm like, number one, that's I'm sure that's illegal. You can't just take somebody's number. Rude. <laughs> I know. And two, everybody, absolutely everyone that you can think of. Yeah. DJ. <laughs> oh, God, God, uh, that, that, that's, that's and the now thing, I've got him. I've got him sending me sending me mixes every week. Bless him, uh, yeah, bless him, guy. bless him. I'm blessed. I'm forever. blessed. The dog in the background making a really uh, good guest appearance there. I'll disco. Disco. Shh. <laughs> I have don't. I have full on conversations with my dog. Like she talks to me and everything. It's mental. Oh, yeah, he's just, he's very, um, he's only five months old. Oh, is he still that needy so, phase? He's very needy. And the thing is, because we're working at home constantly, obviously, we're not really going anywhere. Mm. He's just so attached to us now. Mm. So he has a little bit of separation anxiety, which is not good. Yeah, so it's we need tough. to work on that. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. <laughs> How do you work on separation anxiety during a lockdown? That's like the most impossible well, thing off the face of the it, earth. Exactly, you know? exactly. Yeah, anyway, yeah. We'll, well, you know, anim- animals and humans, when they're puppies, they're, they're kind of the same thing. It's like the closest thing you'll have to having a baby, basically. Literally, literally, yeah. up during the night. Yeah, trust me, I, I, I had a puppy years ago and it was enough to put me off having children for life, to be honest. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And I'm not, I'm not even the one who has to do all the work, if, oh, if you get yeah. me. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> So, so so you've had like a really unique like move through the industry and it's almost like you've had a really unique perspective of meeting mm. a lot of these people as they kind of roll through i mean you must have you must have met some amazing characters probably seen one or two things i'm sure but oh yeah uh, yeah yeah oh. yeah 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 i think i could say yes uh, yes i'm sure you could um <laughs> but you know you've obviously as I say, you've just got this really unique kind of like move through the industry. So in terms of like, is there like one thing that a lot of these successful artists have in common, do you think? Or do they have, do they have things in common? Do they have like shared traits? Like you mentioned like Steve Aoki was the first person you'd ever interviewed. And I mean, you must have interviewed practically everybody there is to interview by now. So, mm. you know, in terms of like the impression that you've had of people, like, you know, is there like some, is there like kind of a shared DNA between a lot of these artists, do you think? Um, They all think they're really cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that goes without saying. I mean, you don't do the job unless you think that, do you? Literally, like, I'm like, hi. Hey, what's up? I'm like, nothing, just here for the interview. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I'm joking. There's, you, I mean, you meet all different types of personalities. I don't know, really. That's a really interesting question. Um, Paul, just... Disco! Can you take him? That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know. I think everybody's kind of... I think everyone is different I don't know if there's anything I could say um I found in all of them um they're all very very especially when it comes to interviewing they all want to uh, get the interview over as quickly as possible <laughs> and carry on doing whatever they were doing before so everything always seems a little bit rushed but yeah I mean I just guess it depends who it is and, and, and where we are you know mm. um but I do, I do always remember that at the beginning that I always used to think, oh, everybody's just so cool. <laughs> and I just seem like this, really, this is little girl, like really nervous about interviewing, interviewing everyone. Um, and there was, oh God, the, sometimes I just said that before as well, but I look back on some of these interviews. I actually, I still have a lot of them on my YouTube channel, but they're on private because I just don't want anybody oh, to see Of course it is. I was just about to say, what's that YouTube channel? Do you want to uh, plug that for the, uh, the listening audience? <laughs> I do not. Because sometimes I look back, I'm like, why did I bloody hell ask that question? What a stupid question that is. I've been there because I've done a lot of those interviews myself uh, for the likes of Cream Fields and stuff. And yeah. I mean, I had a couple of interviews that like, that, it, there was one interview so bad that it went so off the rails at Cream Fields one year, they couldn't use it. And, <gasps> but it was also one of the most h- hilariously weird situations I'd found myself in where it was back when like, it was back when dubstep was a thing i mean God, <laughs> sound, how old do i sound but uh, it was the year uh, magnetic man played live at, at cream fields and it was like you know artwork scream and banger and all that and it was a big deal and whatever and they, they just come off stage and they got shuffled into this like artist tent where i was supposed to be interviewing everyone and it was hysterical because they were clearly still like you know feeling the buzz and the adrenaline of the, of the performance and they they just got into a really mischievous mood where basically they were saying like yeah this is our last performance we're not going to do it anymore we're breaking up and uh, in fact we're not breaking up we're just going to leave the music industry and we're going to open up a uh, a dog sa- a sanctuary in Croydon <laughs> And they just completely derailed the interview. And then there was this really weird moment where Skrillex basically appeared from nowhere and then jumped in front of the camera. <laughs> and then he started acting because he heard that, like, we were going to talk about this, opened up this dog sanctuary in Croydon. He ended up, like, barking like a dog on camera. And it that just it so just funny. went so wrong. And I, I've still to this day not seen the footage of it, but I'm desperate oh, to see it. it. I'm, you need that. It was about ten years ago. I was desperate, desperate to see it because it would just be so hilarious, that's like just hilarious. to watch it. My my reaction would probably just be, I don't know, I, just, I just that can't even so imagine good. it. Can't even imagine it. So I know what it's like because you know, I, the, you say a lot of these people like you know they want to get it over and done with as quickly as possible, and then the ones that do engage with you just want to completely derail it and just turn it into a car crash. Well, actually, do you know what the, with Skrillex the, that kind of happened with me as well. So. <laughs> I thought he was because I was really nervous to meet Skrillex. Yeah. I was like, oh, God, like God, he's massive, um, and I remember being really, really nervous and getting there. And he was just like the nicest guy ever. And just before the camera guy hit record, he was like, "Wait, I've got a really good idea." I was like, "What?" He was like, "You pretend you're me, and I'll pretend you're you." And I was like, <laughs> "What?" And then the guy's like recording, and he's like, "So." Here I am backstage with Skrillex. How are you? And I'm like, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> so I had to pretend that I was Skrillex throughout this whole interview. I think that one is actually still up. I was going to say, please too. don't put that on private because I need to see that. No, that that was that one is still up. Brilliant. And then I don't even know how we got to that part of the conversation, but then he starts talking about him. He was like, oh. Yeah, that's right. He was like, yeah, I'm going to be performing tonight here at Amnesia. I'm going to be doing my tap dance show. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> show us how you tap dance. And then he just all of a sudden randomly starts doing this tap dance like in the middle of this interview. And, Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, the, sometimes you are really surprised. Like there's some interviews that you get to and you think, oh, like this is going to be a tough one, you know. Mm. 
And then it's like the best interview ever and, and vice versa. I've, I mean, I've interviewed some people. I'm like, yeah, this. I'm sure this is going to be like amazing. And then you're like, the answers are like, yeah. Oh, no. God, it's the worst, isn't it? Don't know. Maybe. And I'm like, oh, do you know how to speak? <laughs> <laughs> it's so tough isn't it because like you know some people just aren't really kind of and and it's not a criticism like some people are just genuinely quite shy and quite sort of socially awkward and stuff you know exactly i know that will happen the one the person who i did find that was 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 with martin garrix but he was like 16 at the time oh, when God, I he, probably wasn't, him. he was old enough to be in the club yeah he literally yeah he, i don't think he was even allowed to be in there and bless him he was really 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 nervous mm. um it was literally his like uh, his very beginnings mm. and the answers were very yeah no um, okay <laughs> i'm sure he's definitely definitely not like that now but yeah 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 it's a funny it's a funny thing and it just shows you know these i've, I've always said to people no matter what that you know these people that they are they are the same as us you know i've always had that that kind of approach and i don't know whether it's because i'm just you know a rough ass from liverpool and i don't treat anybody any differently but i've never been i mean i've been like starstruck don't get me wrong like you know what i mean i've i've definitely had moments like that especially when i was younger yeah. you know 17 hanging off the dj booth the cream listening to sasha like wow you know and now he's now, now he's texting me or fuming all day because liverpool lost last night and it's just a bit of a weird journey overall as we talked about previously but you know th- these people like you know they, they, they still they've still got to take the bins out you know what i mean they've absolutely. still got to pay the bills like everybody else so you know absolutely the pro I... sorry go on. no i was just gonna say i did a, um a podcast episode last year um, it was just me. Um, obviously, had no guests that day. <laughs> so, what can I talk about? Um, and I did an, an episode on tips for DJs um, that get nervous before interviews. And my number like one thing was that, like, just remember, I am a person just like you or whoever's interviewing you and that even maybe that person's nervous because I still get nervous when I interview people Mm. that five ten minutes before you know connecting or just before the camera comes on I still get really really nervous and I think it's good to remind artists that the person that's probably interviewing as well they also have feelings and could be feeling exactly the same way, way as you are as well and I think when you think like that, it does make you feel a little bit more calmer, you know. Yeah, totally. And I think it's going to be, you know, important going forward because one of the things we I was talking to Lydia about earlier was hopefully through all of this, you know, all of this because we don't really need to call it by its name anymore, you know. Um, have you not given it a name? I thought you would have given it some kind of name. <laughs> Clusterfuck. Let's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. basically you know we're, we're gonna reach a time where we are all gonna get back together eventually and one of my hopes is that i think it's gonna make people a little bit more compassionate and a little bit more empathetic yeah towards <laughs> everyone else and i think it's hopefully gonna make things a little easier across the board because there's maybe going to be a little less pressure hopefully and i think we can maybe you know kind of just interface with people in a bit more of a an authentic yeah. and a bit more of an, a less sort of guarded way because obviously you know things were spinning so fast with the scene and gigs and tours and everything else and again that's something else i spoke to lydia about where you know it, it's it's kind of it, was, it kind of got unsustainable absolutely after a while and you know once we do start to kind of slowly but surely ease ourselves back in hopefully that some of that kind of you know social awkwardness or hopefully some of that kind of anxiety around these things like it like being interviewed or interviewing artists Mm -hmm. we're going to be able to just connect maybe a little bit more on a on a human level a little bit more because we're going to have a new appreciation of of what we do and more importantly what we had what we lost and also now what we're going to regain no absolutely i totally agree with you i i think also this long pause this long break that we're all having i think it has really i think a lot of people have really used it um you know for personal growth and to you know just to really look back and see exactly where they are in their career but at the same time i think it's it has made people a bit more well i hope a little bit more empathetic and you know want to 
help other people connect on a higher level with other people rather than you know just only being focused on what they're doing and in uh, their own little bubble you know I think this has made people see a lot more uh, see a much bigger picture um and also I think it's been nice I think we're all still very very connected in the industry even though we're not actually physically seeing each other I think more than ever I'm not sure about everyone but in my case for example I do feel a lot more connected to other people in the industry even though I haven't seen them um and I think that I think that will really really help the industry come together with what you're saying before when it comes to I don't know say interviews or helping people out or wanting to coll- collaborate with other artists I think it, it this time is really going to push for these things to happen because people are going to be out of their own little bubble that we're all in in this fast paced world and now I've got to do this and I've got to do that and now I've got to be here and you don't really think about what everybody else around you is doing Mm -hmm. so um so yeah so I think I really really do hope that things will change a little bit when we when we go back Mm -hmm. to normality when we go back to normality I I think we're very much in charge of that as well I think we get to decide the rules of engagement and I know I'm definitely going to return a little softer a little slower a little more considered and you know i think things like this like what we're mm. doing right now like is incredibly important right now because yeah. you know i mostly talk to my dog as i've said before <laughs> i have full-on conversations with my dog i don't really speak <laughs> to many other people so actually like connecting with people like yourself and you know getting to know you through working together between myt and hello mm. demo and doing your podcast and now this it's it's amazing to think like you know i feel like we've we've built quite a good connection yeah yet we've never actually met in person i know isn't that strange i mean yeah it, it's but it's possible though that's the thing it is it's totally it is. possible literally one i've actually my latest episode of my podcast with a friend of mine called farah she works at beatport i know farah and farah Syed. Have, yeah, yeah. With farah. yeah i've worked with farah she's great <laughs> she's so lovely i absolutely love her to bits and i actually had totally forgotten that we've actually only physically met once in our lives <laughs> but she's like a close friend of mine but we've never really you know we haven't actually physically spent that so spent that much time together um so it was really funny when we we're talking about it i was like hang on we actually have not really like you know hung out together and really you know done a lot of things together but I still like know what you're doing. You know what I'm doing. We're still super, super connected. So this time has been great for that. I think you know mm. just to connect with other people, and especially with the podcast. One of the reasons that I wanted to start the podcast was because there was just so many people in the industry that I didn't know what they did or what their job consists of, and even like down to things that you think that you know. Okay. Obviously, I know what a manager is, but I don't know exactly what a manager's role consists of. Like, mm. what is your day to day like? How do you start working with a manager? Um, you, you know, there's just so many, there's so many tiny, tiny little things you just don't know about other people in the industry. So, as you just said, having a podcast and being able to connect with people and you know find out their stories, I think it's, I think it's fascinating. Absolutely love it. Mm. Yeah, and it's exactly why I did the podcast earlier with Lydia as well, because not only do I think a lot of people in the industry don't really understand what Lydia does for yeah. you know, real, because, you know, as I said to Lydia, there's a lot of artists who I work with who they, they see PR and having PR as like having another box ticked on the road to making it in bunny yeah. ears. And it's like, well, you don't even know what it is, so why do you why do you even need it you know and a lot of the time you don't so it was kind of just you know laying it out what Lydia actually does and what she needs in order to be successful in her role and I'm going to be honest with you I learned an absolute ton and it made me reflect on oh there was one or two releases of mine or one or two things that happened in my career it's like should have called Lydia (laughs) yeah no exactly I think sometimes we just think that we know all of these things when actually like there's just there's so much more behind even just you know things that we think could could probably be quite straightforward and simple so it's it's I think it's so so important to you know reach out to other people and find out what other people are up to because sometimes you just 
you, you could be really surprised with what other people to do what, with what other people do and and new ideas can come to you it makes you feel more creative and you're like well if that person does that then and that person does that it's like connecting dots you know whereas if you don't really put yourself out there you don't talk to people you don't find out what other people do I think it's you kind of you, you could lose opportunities I think in a way hmm. yeah and it's also an opportunity to kind of reflect on where you are at in, uh, as a person individually yeah. as well you know and it's definitely I mean we, we spoke about this on on your podcast but it's it's worth kind of you know talking about again and getting a little update it's you know the the pause that we've been sort of forced into i think it's really helped in a lot of ways for people like you were saying people doing the personal growth work mm. and also realizing where we're currently at and maybe for want of a better expression we were aiming at the wrong things and we thought we wanted things that actually it turns out weren't the things that either were meant for or the things we really need yeah and i think that's been big for me because i've really sort of i've really connected very deeply to sort of my purpose through all of this and you know i'm by no means the biggest named dj on the face of the earth and i've kind of come to a place where i feel like i'm okay with what i've achieved Mm -hmm. and i feel like my creativity is starting to come out in different ways like i've just started writing a book I've got this podcast, I've got NYT, I'm still writing music, but it's in a completely different context now, although I might just, you know, put the odd dance floor track out if it comes. Yeah. But ultimately, it's like, it's it's being okay with the fact that, you know, this type of situation obviously will usher in a great amount of change. So have you found that in a similar way where you've kind of maybe connected to your purpose and a bit of a... A, yeah. a deeper way and <clears throat> absolutely i think i was just i was rush 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 and just thought that i had to do so many different things mm. um to reach to, to be happy in a way it's, it's hard to explain but i i on it i first of all i just don't i haven't paused since i started in this industry at all i have not had a break I even like holidays I've gone on I've just always been working full on non-stop so being able to have this time and eat and having less work has really given me um, a lot of space to, to do a lot of thinking um, but yeah I think I think one of the main main things was I'm 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 quite a, a people pleaser I think in a way like I a, a lot of things I do I use not so much now but I think since I since for a very long time I used to do things like okay well I'll do this just so that so and so doesn't get upset or I'll do that I'll do this and I I think I used to shift what actually I wanted and what was important to me to one side just to do everything for everybody else and I've this this past year um I really, really realized that and realized that, you know what, this is my life and I should be doing the things that make me happy mm. and not what I think is going to look, is what everybody else is going to accept, you know? So even if people don't like what I'm doing or don't like the way I've done something, why should I be, why should I be so bothered about it? I think some, I used to do a lot of things or really push myself to the limit just so that it was so that um other people would be happy and instead of putting myself first mm. um and that is a big mistake because number one you just run yourself into the ground for other people um and two as i just said it shouldn't be like that like it should be the things that make me happy and if you know i don't want to reply to this person's email instantly then i'm not going to do it because that you know it's just the tiny tiny little habits that i'm just have been changing over the year um that have really brought me to a much much better much happier me i guess mm. yeah totally because it's it's interesting that you know i've been through a similar thing as well i was a bit of a fixer you know, and I think I've I've definitely got that about me because you know, I'm a teacher at the end of the day. Like, 
you know, yeah. the ultimate expression of trying to fix someone, <laughs> do you know what I mean? If I'm not careful. But and and it's been like through me learning how to empower myself and me taking my own power back by exactly. stopping that whole thing of, of fixing and you know, one thing I've I've said a lot of the time is, you know, what other people think of you is none of your business. Yeah. To an yes. extent. It's so so true. Yeah, it's, it's really so true. true. It's really true. Yeah, like it, as you just said, it just takes kind. It takes away your your energy and your power. And I think I just kind of lost my. What's the word I'm looking for? Like the path that I was going down. Like I just everything kind of just seemed a bit like fuzzy. I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do. I was kind of doing everything for everyone else. I wasn't really pausing and thinking how I felt and what I wanted to do. And if somebody else said to me, well, you, you should be doing this and you should be doing that. And look, so-and-so is doing this. And then it makes you think like, oh, yeah, you're right. I shouldn't be doing it that way. I should be doing it how so-and-so are doing it. And then all of this happened. And I'm like, no, this has to stop. Mm. This has to stop. I feel I'm lost. I feel lost. Mm. Does I don't any really of this know. really matter? yeah where am I going with all of this why am I you know doing things that are going to make other people happy and you know and they're not really very fulfilling for me mm. um so yeah th this time has been amazing for me to realize that because otherwise I think I would have just carried on doing what I was doing and just every single day doing the same you know just doing it and and yeah it just just, just wasn't going to get me anywhere so in in that sense it's been really positive really really positive oh good good i'm glad i'm glad i mean to be honest it's been a bit of a a universal story for me to mm. hear from people that they've all or people i've spoken to at least have all gone through some pretty profound personal shifts in the last year and mm -hmm. have kind of come to an understanding about you know where things are maybe a little bit sticky for themselves yeah and you know for me as i say it's been getting to a place of acceptance that i am exactly where i'm meant to be that is like my daily reminder at the moment uh, you are exactly where you need to be um stop thinking about you know where i'm going to be in the next year or you know where i'm supposed to be next week just everything will work the way it needs to just trust that everything is going to be fine because where you are right now is exactly where you need to be and i literally think of that every single day and it's it is so so helpful when you think of it that way because it's true it's just where you're supposed to be and what's supposed to be happening right now hmm. that's true because the the thing is there's a balance between pointing yourself in the right direction working yeah. hard towards what you want but then balancing that with allowing things to unfold kind of naturally as well mm. which is something i've really really learned not just through the pandemic but also in the last sort of four years leading up to it like as you know from when we spoke on your podcast it was yeah you know it was a profound journey which is mm. what i'm writing the book about at the moment and the interesting thing was i learned how much that I was unconsciously kind of undermining myself by trying to manipulate situations towards what I wanted it to be rather <laughs> than allowing it to be what it was or what yeah. it is or what it should be in order for me to take the the lesson from it, to take the wisdom from it, you know? Yeah. And that was such a massive thing because I, I learned by the end of that process that I need to leave a little bit of a space where my lizard brain would normally operate where it's like right well if i can do this and i can make that happen and then that person will do this and then then i'll be where i want to be and then i'll be happy yeah and it never ever ever works out that way and you realize that if you leave that space where you're mm -hmm. again where your lizard brain normally operates yep whatever arrives in that space is normally better than what your lizard brain had come up with in the first place yeah <laughs> yeah 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 it's so true you know something else that i've i've really um i'm so happy that I, i've started doing and has been a massive game changer for me is saying no 
No, I can't do it. No, it's such a beautifully complete sentence. Ah, oh, so lovely. I used to just say yes to everything again, just because I know that, oh, they've asked me to do it. And, you know, oh, can you can you translate this from English to Spanish to me for in the next two hours? Yes, 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 I'll do it. I'll do it. And then, you know, just tiny, just whatever it is just used to put myself under so much pressure and now i just love saying no to people <laughs> no i'm sorry i can't do that no nope, sorry no time i have other things to do which might even just be sat down on the sofa but it's still my time you know and it's it, that's that's been really great for me as well well that's the really thing yeah. learn the power of the word no mm. and you've probably heard this before but you know the adage of when you mm. say yes to something you say no to something else so you've got to make sure that the thing that you're saying no to is something you actually want to say no to. Exactly. And that's another kind of root of like disempowerment, which again, I was a total yeser as well at one point. And, you know, it wasn't until I kind of completely transformed MYT into what it is now mm. and it being more of a, a community model than you know, working intensely one-to-one with people where, you know, I think it's, I mean, I call it freelancer's disease. It's like self-employed yeah. syndrome. It's like it is. you don't know when the next paycheck's coming from, so you just default to saying it yes is. to whatever comes in. That's probably right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, You're, that is so true. That is probably it is because you you just never never know what's next, do you? You're like yes, 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 but then you also most of the time say yes to everything, and then. Just, it just piles up and piles up and then you're like why did I say yes and also another thing that I've been really changing is to stop saying sorry I used to apologize for everything I'm like I don't need to give explanations that's just the way I've done it you know it, that's it and I used mm. to say sorry I'm so sorry but I'm really sorry I'm so sorry about this I'm like ah oh, no a wise person said to me once that when you say sorry, what you actually mean is thank you. So yeah. rather than saying, sorry, I'm late, you can say, thanks for bearing thanks with for... me. Did we speak about this we, last time? We might have done a little bit, yeah, but it's or, it, it's definitely... Oh, I've read what you just said somewhere, like, very, not, not long ago, mm. but it is... Yeah, you've got to look at it that way, mm. spin it around. Yeah, totally, because, you know, you, st- you start apologising for yourself, you never stop. I know. Mm. Now, it does come from that sort of lack of self-worth as well to an extent. It's like if you're somebody who feels like you have to apologise for yourself the whole time, you know. Totally. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, you're not really valuing yourself, you know. Mm. If that's the way that you've decided to do it or you're late for something, you know, that's just the way it is. You don't really need to apologise unless you've, like, insulted somebody or something. But apart from that, like, you don't really have a, a reason to to be apologizing all the time apart from apologizing all the time so you can apologize for apologizing all the time exactly <laughs> i've even told people off that will you stop saying sorry for, for saying sorry yeah. like seriously like you're, sorry. you're starting to fold it in on itself now it's becoming quantum like yeah but uh, it's interesting because like i i also like i go to the point where like i i try and eliminate certain words from my vocabulary as well like when I'm texting or when I'm sending an email or even when I'm talking, like there's there's two words I really kind of focus on that I try and use as little as possible, and you know they're not swear words because I'm from Liverpool. They they're just just part. Of, it's just that's just in the bloodstream. Like you know we elevate swearing to an art form up here. Can't help that one. Oh God, you know it feels so good though. Uh, and, the, oh, yes. and the thing is, like I use like practices, like I say, like eliminating the word should is a big one i've got mm. really bad problems with the word should i think it's actually one of the most destructive words in language because of what it actually denotes when you get underneath the surface of it and the other one is just like i'm just doing this and it's almost as if like in the same way that you ask for an apology from someone for doing something yeah. really minor that doesn't need an apology if you're saying i'm just doing this what you're actually doing is you're asking the other person for permission yeah and it's like well i don't need like don't get me wrong i love you to bit but i don't need your permission to make a cup of tea yeah do you know what i mean i'm just <laughs> heading to the shop i'm like i don't need your permission to go to the shop exactly or your we... validation or your approval to go to tesco's you know exactly i think there's so there's so many people that 
that will probably be listening to this and be like, yeah, I'm definitely somebody that says sorry a lot and just a lot. I think we all, I think we all do it um, sometimes without even thinking about it. But when you do stop and think about it, it does make you realize and think about, I'm really probably not valuing myself as much. So, you know, probably should be. Mm. And that has like knock on effects on the rest of your life as well, you know, because if you're unconsciously kind of undermining yourself, then the things that you would like to have happen are less likely to happen. That's been a very, very tough lesson for me as well of learning how to like fully value myself and, and be able to, you know, actually stand within myself and be in my own body in a way that's confident yeah and say you know look i'm I'm proud of my achievements and i'm proud of the person that i am and you know no nobody can kind of take that away from you you know so why apologize for it yeah exactly exactly no it's so true and it's such a it's something so small that can be changed but such a big game changer in 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 your everyday life and just the way you, you, the way you are, you know, mm. definitely makes you feel a lot more um, light and free, I think, mm. would be a good way to describe it. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I think we've all been through parts of this last year and in life in general, you know, where things get like really heavy and really sticky and stuff like that as well. I mean, I've just gone through a little period of that myself, to be honest with you. Like, Mm. you know, as I mentioned, like this third lockdown has been very difficult for people in the UK. It's been difficult for me on a mental level. And don't get me wrong, I've got it. I've got it cushy compared to most other people, you know. I get to sit at home and talk to people like you all day. Do you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> I'm, I've got no problems, but it still comes up like that inadequacy and stuff. I mean, I I also realised because I was talking to you about my my borderline exercise addiction in the, in yeah. recent days, and <laughs> you know the 98 days on on the bounce without a without a rest and stuff, which is just I look back at it now and I'm like, what was it doing? You know, I was definitely using it to cope with the anxiety of lockdown and not traveling and looking at the same four walls every day for sure but then there's a there's a degree of like there's a degree of like self-punishment in there as well do you know what i mean of like self-flagellation and almost like i'm thrashing myself by running half marathons every day for the laugh like i mean we're talking like oh i'm just nipping out for a run it was like i'm doing like anywhere between seven and ten miles Oh my god! You know, because I've got it in my head that like, unless and, and even at my level, with so much of a level of self awareness, it can still come up and hit you. But do you what, know what, what do you mean? Like, do you feel? Did you feel like you had to go out and do it because you're at home so much? Is that what you mean? Like, you just need to get out there and run? Yeah, that and also as well. You know, I mean, I'm talking working out in general. Like, I'm talking weights. I'm talking kettlebells, cycling. Like, you just have to be doing something. I've just got to be doing something, and I've got to be moving forward somehow. And, you yeah. know, I do I do suffer from an excess of energy most of the time, which is why you can't shut me up. But <laughs> also, it's it, there, there was, I've got to be honest with you, there was a little bit of the, I'm not good enough in there as well. Really? And I'm not going to be good enough until I can, you know, run a 40-minute 10K or run a triathlon or be able to, you know, hit this or do that, you know. And that that's a part of my mindset that really... I've had to work on a lot in recent years because I define myself through like the achievement of goals. And one of the things that I did consistently to myself was when I achieved those goals, I shifted the goalposts on myself. And then it was, ne- it was no matter what I did, it was never ever going to be good enough. I know. So that's the thing. It, it shows that you, you, even though you can do a hell of a lot of work on yourself and you can be aware of these things it can still sneak up on you. It really, really can. And yeah, you've, you've got can. to be so, so careful. And, you know, for me, I've, I'd say learning to, like, really sit with those uncomfortable feelings has been a big thing for me. And it's allowed me to kind of, like, rather than spiral down mm. into the pit of that, I've just been able to kind of over the last week or so give myself a break and go, chill out, sit with whatever discomfort's coming up, feel it fully don't repress it don't push it down don't run away from it yeah and just you know sit with your feelings sit with it and allow it to subside naturally and 
that's kind of what yeah. I've been doing for the last week and a half and I'm definitely like I've definitely learned my lesson on that you know and yeah absolutely I I've been to, I've been actually been in a sim in a similar space because um I've hurt my knee running uh, mm. as well on uh, last Sunday and I was the same I used to run every single day and I always have done I've always really really loved running and I've never ever had any problems until last week and I was like god it had to be now you know we're just starting this lockdown again and this was just like my bit of a, my escape and I came home, I was really, I was angry. I was just angry with myself because it had been hurting the day before and I still went and did it and I probably could have avoided all of this. And I was exactly saying, I thought to myself, you know what, I'm just, I'm just going to accept this. It is what it is. I'll find other things to do that will still keep me moving, but I'm not going to let this get to me, ruin my day, ruin my week, be grumpy as hell because I can't do the exercise that I want to and just accept it and it's fine um and it's it, it changes just your whole perspective and just your your energy and mind I think when you think of it that way because the moment you just you say, say to yourself okay it is what it is that's just how it's going to be you just kind of just accept it and get on with it you know hmm. and it just makes everything you and everybody else around you makes life so much easier <laughs> yeah tell me about it tell me about it i mean i didn't even like myself over the last few weeks to be honest with you it was just like i was doing ridiculous things i was going out and running like five to seven miles on christmas day do you know what i mean oh my goodness i know i definitely over christmas i think to be honest with you that was why after christmas i was like now i definitely need to run more than ever because we just <laughs> ate and drank so much so so much we went on a cruise on for christmas last year it was like an all-inclusive buffet every single day and i ate more this christmas than i did when we we're on the cruise last year and it was buffet breakfast buffet lunch buffet <laughs> snacks buffet <laughs> dinner alcohol as much as you want and i still managed to eat and drink more this christmas because i think i was just like fuck it it's been a shit year i'm just gonna eat and drink as much as i can <laughs> now you've got it you've i mean i mean if, if ever there was gonna be a time it's now isn't it, Do you know what I mean? yeah that's exactly and then and so that's why i was like trying to do as much sport as i possibly can you know and just try and make me feel better and then that happened but then also i think when you do accept these things i think it's so, it it, um, for example, like if you start dieting and you're on these diets and you're so stressed out about what you're eating and calorie counting, and because I've been through this as well, it just it never seems to work. You just the weight just sticks, nothing mm -hmm. happens. But that moment that you just let it all go, relax, accept that that's what it is. That's when everything starts changing and all the good things start happening. And I and so it, obviously it doesn't just apply to dieting or whatever i think anything in life the moment that you accept something then good things happen you know it's when you fight something that's already happening when you just you know things go downhill mm -hmm. that's totally right i mean i've had that myself on physical kind of context as well as like creative contexts in career contexts yeah. it's you know you start to fight against it you start to fight against your own body your own situation etc yeah. you know it's it's all forms of resistance at the end of the day and you know whatever resists it definitely persists and Absolutely. it's learning to let go of it and that Absolutely. that that is the major thing so you know the the balance of i've really learned the true power of rest through all of this like real proper deep rest okay and Me too. The, the the art and the power of basically just doing absolutely nothing and again like mm -hmm. you were saying before how do you get to that point if you're saying yes to everything you can't therefore it's you just, can't. you're just denying yourself yeah absolutely and I, I you know rest is something that i up until obviously the uh everything that's happening happened um i was the same like my days were very I, I just never knew when to stop basically mm. so I could just carry on sending emails sending emails or answer to this person as soon as they've sent as soon as I get an email into my inbox I'm like replying straight away you know get back to everyone as soon as possible and 
the feeling of getting to whatever point it is in the daytime sometimes it might even be like 5 p.m and i'm like do you know what i'm gonna shut it down for the day because i can't and mm. that's what i feel like i want to do is such a great feeling mm. of accepting that you can actually do that mm. and that it's fine to leave an email for a day and reply to that person a day or two later you know mm. um so that's been another big a big change as well and not just having that intense what uh, intense day of work and never ever knowing when to end and when to stop and just carrying on and carrying on and then first thing you wake up in the morning and back on my emails laid in bed no phones until 10 a.m has been my new rule which has been another amazing change mm. um 8 p.m. till 10 a.m. nothing turned off excellent excellent yeah yeah i read yeah. um subsequently since we spoke the last time i've been just reading books like they're going out of print and i've what just been reading oh god all kinds i'm um i've just read uh the first one i really just devoured in like a week was um on this kind of subject it was by a guy called cal newport called deep work and mm. it's about all of this stuff and actually you know how technology and how the modern world is like a really big impediment towards doing your best work because you you're constantly interrupted email yeah. calendars calls meetings blah 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 so you know what what this book talks about is how you can actually create a regime within your life that allows mm -hmm. you to go deep because what they're saying what what this guy's saying he's like a professor he was saying you know the the number one skill that we're all going to need is to be able to do deeply focused work for extended periods of time and but that applies whether or not you're in the studio whether yeah. or not you know you're you know writing articles doing you know copywriting or radio host whatever it is like you know you need long stretches of uninterrupted time so you mm -hmm. can actually operate at your best and one of the things i've really learned from that is i largely try and do all of my business related meetings now on mondays that's a good idea so i literally dedicate your day to it sit there from like you know i'll work out from like say 10 till 11 and then from about 12 lunchtime onwards all day i'll just rack all of my zoom calls out all of my meetings everything else and i've got the rest of the week then mm. to to basically dedicate towards yeah. creative work the projects that i want to work on you know i can take a little bit of time to rest because i'm teaching most evenings during the week with myt and yeah. i've got time to really then properly like prepare for those sessions so i can put my all into them when i'm delivering them and it's been a, yep. an absolute revolution and checking my email once a day oh yeah that sounds so lovely and just replying quickly that's no, a complete yeah. distraction it really is and you know it even goes into a lot of detail about like is this even an, you know you might have an email and they're asking for a reply is it even worth replying to and yeah. how do you reply in a way mm. that resolves things as quickly as possible so you can get back to doing deep work yeah. it's a really yeah. fascinating yeah. thing so you know i think for, for what you're saying of like what you're doing with no phones between 8 and 10 a.m and stuff i think you'd find that a really interesting read no 8 p.m and 10 a.m oh, 8 p.m and 10 a.m okay yeah so like mm -hmm. the whole night nice. the nice. no not just two hours nice i think it's just about creating your own space and your own way of living isn't it really and making sure that whatever comes in from the outside world to distract you it's all about knowing how to manage them distractions and either um looking at them or turning away from them until un until the actual time arrives for you to be doing that chore or answering that email or whatever you're doing um i started must be about five months ago uh, getting up every morning at 6 a.m. 6 a.m. until 9 a.m. is my three hours for me to do the things that I like to do without looking at my phone, my opening my laptop, news, anything. So 
And honestly, it's my favorite three hours of the day. And I, I never, ever think, oh, God, 6 a.m., I've got to get up. In fact, last night, I, I didn't even have my phone in, in the room. My alarm didn't go off. And I was still awake at 6 a.m. this morning, like, oh, I'm just going to get up and, you know, do all these, do all the little things I like to do. Mm. And it's been so nice to create that time frame and that small amount of on that and that space for me on a daily basis just to just for me and for nobody else at all and i don't know if it's just because it's still dark at that time as well it feels like even extra special <laughs> like <laughs> this is just me in my own zone right now and just literally everything's turned off there's no life outside or everybody's lights are still off you know mm. and it's like it's it's nice it's a really really nice it's feeling. a really interesting like really still part of the day isn't it around that time because i even I feel it here like getting up at seven every morning like mm. six, six, six is too much for me sorry can't do it no, <laughs> se- seven's seven's cushy that i can do that it's a middle ground eight o'clock i feel like i'm already wasting the day seven o'clock i'm good me too but you know at that time of day like there's not much there's no no traffic on the roads under normal circumstances mm. you know no, there's yeah there's people milling about but not many and the day's yet to kind of start so there's like this really interesting stillness yeah where you can <clears throat> really get into a, a really interesting and really productive and really nice sort of frame of mind uh, a friend of mine who i've worked with he's a big hollywood film composer called junkie xl mm. and yes. yeah I've, I've worked with with tom and he's, he's, a, he's a wicked guy. He gets up at four. Does he? Gets up at four because what he's actually done is that he's figured out what is what he calls his golden hours are. And he's figured out that he's actually his most inspired and his most creative between the hours of 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. Oh, wow. That's interesting. So, we, so he actually works at them times. Yes. So he'll get up and he'll write at, like from 4 to like 8 a.m. Mm. He'll then take his kid to school, come home, do some meetings till about yeah. lunchtime, amble yeah. about a bit, have something to eat, maybe write another two or three hours in the afternoon. Yeah. To get to go and get his kid from school, has a normal family dinner every night, goes to bed about eight, nine o'clock, mm-hmm. and is up at four the next morning to do it all again. Well, that's, I think that's why I kind of like it as well, because I feel like when I get to the end of my work mm. at the end of the day, I've done all of the things that I've, that are for me that I've wanted to do already. Mm. So if I, if I didn't do them from 6am to 9am and then had to do them at the end of the day when there's so much going on. So the things I like to do in the morning are read, meditate, exercise and write. Mm. Uh, if I finish work at you know whatever eight nine p.m., I really don't feel like in the mood or in the right space to be meditating, to be writing, to be reading. There's so much going on, so I think it's just like the whole package that just makes it like so just nice in the morning. You know, the stillness, there's quiet. But I think again, it just depends on what you what that time for you looks like what are the things that do fulfill you and find in the right time to do it mm-hmm. um and then yeah and then switching off at the end of the day you know cooking sitting down that's it go to sleep at like 11 12 and back up again in the morning <laughs> i really honestly like now thinking just talking about this type of thing the thought of like going on tour somewhere or like getting on a plane to go play a DJ gig. It, it, I'll be honest, it petrifies me now. Seriously, <laughs> like, of just, like, how out of my rhythm and out of my routine. Like, I've just ran too much for a few days and I'm absolutely screwed. Do you know what right. I mean? Like, never mind, like, getting on a plane, going to another country, DJing at four in the morning. It's just like... I know. I thought the exact same thing um, a few days ago. I was like, when things go back to normality and I have to, like... I don't know, broadcast from a festival or event or a club or whatever, and I'm going to get back home at 6 a.m. or whatever time it's going to be. That's going to totally ruin up my whole day. That's not how I work <laughs> I'm, anymore. I'm going to be out. I'm going to be out of the game for like two days <laughs> afterwards. Literally, literally. You know what I mean? It's going to be really, it's going to be really strange to to kind of get back into it. But then, I, 
yeah, I guess it's just adapting, you know. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I think it's also realizing that it's actually it's actually a positive because you know going back to 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 tom to junkie xl for a second it's like it's not as if he's you know decided to take a step back from his career i mean literally to a movie he's like mad max fury road and you know justice wow. league snyder cut and you know yeah. kong versus godzilla which is just about to come out it's like he's he's doing the best yeah. work of his career and he's got an incredibly well settled kind of rhythm oh, yeah. going and it's like i was you know i was at the time i was like hmm there needs to be a leaf taken out of this guy's book here because <laughs> he's doing his yeah. best work and he's like to to take a horrible horrible saying like he is literally living his best life yeah exactly that. absolutely and i think as well um well in my case for example starting the day doing all these different things I like I feel like I am really putting myself first so kind of this kind of ties into what I was saying before starting the day doing all of the things that I like to do that has nothing to do with work and it's just all the things that fulfill, fulfill me it's like yeah this these are the things that I like and I'm going to be the first thing that I think about today and once I've done all the nice things that I like to do then I'll carry on doing everything else absolutely self first is not selfish is something mm -hmm. that I really aspire I really kind of like you know subscribe to and you know I think I mentioned it on, on another podcast but it was the fact that you know I'm in a I'm in a serious long-term committed relationship with myself because it's the only relationship I'm going to be in for the rest of my life, so I'd yeah. best make it a good one. And love it, and love myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Just not work out for a hundred days solid without a rest. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like you're testing me limits on that one. Do you know what I mean? But it's it's totally true because like that allows you to be, and this is something we definitely teach at NYT is like you know if you do that and you create the right system, the right conditions, the right environment in your life then you're going to do your best work. You're going to be inspired. Yep. You're going to feel yep. good about it. You're going to be joyful about it. And you're going to be a better human being for it at the end of the day. You're going to be better, you know, a better girlfriend, a better boyfriend, a better brother, a better sister, a better parent, a better son, whatever it is you are in life. You mm -hmm. are going to be balanced enough to be able to be the best version of yourself in all situations, which is, you know, that's the definition of success for me, not whether or not you are, you know, flinging yourself from one country to another on a plane or whether or not you're getting mm -hmm. signed to drum code or not, you know? Yeah, exactly. I'm reading a book at the moment called The Happiness Advantage. Oh, I've um, heard about this, yeah. Mm, and it's all about how we always think that to be happy that we have to be successful mm. when actually it's scientifically proven that it's the other way around you need to be happy um you need to be happy to be successful. did i say it the wrong way around no, no you did time? you got it right that's the yeah. that's the ironic <laughs> thing you stopped halfway through a successful move <laughs> happy to be successful um and it's so true and i think it kind of just goes back to you know if you if you don't if you don't love yourself how are you gonna how are you gonna love anything else you know you need to find that inner happiness first before everything else around you mm. um works or or comes into place so yeah it's a really interesting book yeah really exactly interesting. yeah it's really interesting i mean i'm 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 awful for like sort of double or triple fist in books like i i'm like in the, in the scope right. of a day like i'll i'll be reading like three different books at oh, once wow. like because you know I've, I've got books that are kind of like really amenable to me reading them at bedtime and then other ones that like really work for me first thing in the morning and there's different books for different times of the day you know yeah so i like that yeah yeah i mean it's just a natural thing i've always done because i've always i've always been a bit of a scanner to be honest with you because like i've always i've always looked at reading as and this is something else that's come out of the pandemic that i'm loving is that reading was always something of a chore for me it's like something i uh -huh. had to do to get through university or you know yeah. to tick a box or to understand something I'm, i've been very much like I've, I've i've read for insight but mostly read for information yeah and it's really interesting and really important to know the difference between the two and yep. that's why i'm ordering now i don't read ebooks i don't have a kindle i don't read on an yeah. ipad i need an actual physical piece of paper because it just works me for me. me too. and it's interesting because there's, there's studies that are suggesting that people who read ebooks don't retain the information as well 
Really? And you don't in, in, integrate it enough because you tend to read on your phone the same way that you read like a restaurant menu. Uh, yeah, that it's makes like sense. it's very much informational rather than yeah. you know integrated and about insight. Yeah. So I've, I've I've definitely you know I'm keeping I'm keeping uh, my local postman definitely busy with the amount of boxes. Since another day comes by, another book comes in. Isn't it so nice though, to actually have like a physical book in your hand? Oh yeah, yeah. Like I, I I've never ever read a, uh, an ebook or or read on Kindle or anything like that. I need to actually. I'm I'm not a great reader anyway, or I I'm I'm better at writing than I, than I am reading. Mm. Um, but I think it's just because I had half of my English education in the UK and half in Spain. Mm. So when I was 12, we moved to Spain, and so there was quite a few years where I was I found it really hard, you know, to swap from one to the other. So now I do I do find it difficult. I'm quite a slow reader. I have to reread things quite often, so it takes me a while. Yeah, yeah, that's but okay. I, but I love the fact of like having the book in my hand. Oh and, yeah. Like, being able to underline things and writing down notes and remembering where things were. Yeah, I'm definitely a book in one hand, highlighter in the other. That's me. Yeah, for sure, me too. for sure. <laughs> so yeah, I've been reading this book and I, I mentioned it uh, to Lydia as well about um, it's this book called Designing Your Life. And it's really really this. interesting uh, because it's basically this these two guys and and they they run this class at Stanford University. And what they do is literally they apply product design principles to people's lives. And it's actually the wow. most popular class at Stanford University. Really? By a mile, because it's like you get these people who are like, yeah, I'm a I'm a neuroscience major. And so what are you going to do when you leave university? <laughs> I'm going to clue. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Probably go work in Starbucks for a bit, you know? And yeah. it's like, these people are like the brains of our future and they're like, yeah. no idea what I'm going to do in my life. So what I'm going to do next. You know, yeah, so exactly. th- th- they've got a really, really interesting standpoint on it, which is that if, say for example, you know, you take that classic journey of, you know, you should follow your passion and you should, you know, what do you what what's your dream? Like, you should go for your dream and all this stuff. And they yeah. tell this story and I've, I've I've told it before, but it's it's worth me going over. Like you know, this this woman that they've they've taught at this class, and like she was a big shot. She was a big corporate manager, big HR director for a huge corporation. This that, and the other, and you know, but her real passion apparently in life was like Italian food and like you know delis that you'd find in like Tuscany and stuff. And you know, she was like really swept up with her life dream of like being you know the owner of this like Tuscan deli, and she was going to find the building and convert it all and she was going to have this amazing lovely life where you know she'd saunter around with like you know all this Italian food and whatever and lived the dream and she pulled the trigger and she did it and she found the building and she renovated it and opened the business and it was really successful and she absolutely fucking hated every second of it (sighs) really yeah because what she thought she wanted and what actually made her happy was totally different was completely different but the yeah. analogy of like or the question of like you should follow your dream what what do you dream of like that's the thing you should do in life they actually yeah. consider it to be like a dysfunctional question because like if you were to ask that in a product design perspective you'd be laughed out the room yeah. like because basically yeah. these guys are really fascinating they both worked at apple and the mm-hmm. main guy who runs this course was the guy who was at the head of the design team for the first mouse that apple made for the first mouse? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and he then went on and he was the co-founder of, you know, the computer games company, Electronic Arts? Yeah. He was the co-founder of EA. <laughs> what? Like, he's just this incredible brain. And he basically says, like, look, you know, the way we do this and what I'm learning at the moment, it's like there are many yous and they're all great and they can all be happy. And they can all do different things at different times of your life. Mm -hmm. So none of them are wrong. They're all good. You've just got to pick what it is that you want to become next. And how do you do that? If we were designing this like a product, we would go through these phases. We would get curious. We would ask the right questions. We would, first of all, accept where we are right now. But then we would Mm -hmm. go into a phase of designing and building prototypes. 
Yeah. And then we would get to the thing that works, that for what we want, for the question that we want to answer, for the problem we want to solve, and then that will be the one that goes into production. So what I'm, I'm at at this point in the book is they're talking about, you know, you walk into a cinema, right? And there's three screens at this cinema. And this cinema is the Your Life cinema. And mm-hmm. in each of these movie theaters, in each screen, there's a potential life that you can live playing on that screen. So one is your optimized life, which yeah. is what you're doing right now, but optimized to be the best it can be. There's another one, which is if what you do right now disappeared overnight, if, no, if humanity just didn't need it anymore, what would you do? And then the third one is the, you know, shit or get off the pot. Like, no money, no money, no object. Doesn't matter mm-hmm. what anyone think of yet. What would you go and do if, like, the money was fine and nobody would laugh at you? Mm. And then what you do is, is that you don't go, oh, I'll just do that one. You, you go into a phase of, well, I'm going to find people who are doing that right now. Yeah. And I'm going to go and speak to them. And I'm going to find out what it is they like about it, what they don't like about it, what the problems are, what the drawbacks are, and I'm going to see whether that's something I can live with. And then I might even go and get a little bit of experience in those things and then decide whether or not it's something I actually want to do rather than railroading myself into a dream that I end up hating and I end up in a worse position than where I was. Yeah, it's so true. It's so, so true. Do you know, I had this really funny thought... um, it must be about a month ago now something I'd never ever thought about before but it was actually really it was like quite a comforting and nice thought I'd never thought about my future I mean obviously like I think a lot about the next coming years and stuff but I'd never really thought about what my life will be like when I'm like 50 60 70 80 and and about the amount of things I could do and achieve in my full lifetime and I was thinking about it and I was actually getting really excited thinking about oh when I'm like 60 or 70 like all of these different things that I'll be able to do and I actually felt excited that I still have all of that to come and that there's so much more because I just think that for my whole life up until now I when I think about my future it's like a short um, like a short term future mm. so like where I'm going to be in the next three years five years six seven years but I never really have thought beyond that before mm. does that make sense mm. what I'm talking about yeah totally yeah the time horizon is completely different right yeah and for the first time I was I was just sat there thinking god there's just there's so much more time and there's so many there's going to be so many different phases of my life and different things people in it and different places and different experiences and I I'd never really thought about it before and I was like that's really exciting to think like that that there is just going to be so so much more you know oh yeah totally and the fact is you know obviously in terms of health even though we are obviously you know in the pit of a global health crisis you know we are Mm. living longer we're living healthier and the quality of our lives later in life is much better than than it's ever been before so you know you you could literally be i mean the people who i really admire i mean one of my heroes is john williams the guy who did all the scores for like you know star wars indiana jones Mm -hmm. you know it's ridiculous he's the greatest living composer of of any sort of genre he's in his late 80s and he is still knocking film scores out like they're going out of fashion and he's never going to retire. Like, the day he retires is the day they put him in the ground, you know? Yeah. And and yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. he's incredible. And, you know, I've always considered retirement as something of a swear word, if I'm being completely honest. And mm. it's, just, it's just something I can't see myself doing. And, like, I'm 41 in March. And quite frankly, like, I feel like I'm just getting started. I really, really do. And it's, it's, an, and it's an amazing feeling. And, again, like, with where I'm at at the moment... I, I, another thing a friend of mine said to me once is your new life will cost you your old one your new life will cost you your old one and it's that's a mm-hmm. difficult 
thing so ironically for me to be able to move on and do the things that i want to do i want to write books i want to do podcasts i want to climb mountains i want to run triathlons i want to you know possibly even like i've never said this publicly before but i might even want to direct a movie at some point write film music i've got all these creative outlets yeah and i've been primarily driven by making bangers for 20 years yeah. And don't get me wrong, I love that and I'll always do that, but it's not going to be the primary focus for me on a personal level going forward. So this whole sort of life design thing and what we're talking about and looking at it over longer time horizons is massive because you realise that you've been driving yourself for so long by a singular goal. Exactly. Maybe you've overshot the target and you're aiming at something that you've already hit. Or you were never yeah. meant to hit in the first place and you're on the way towards something else. Yeah, absolutely. Like you don't see the the, the bigger picture. You're just focusing on, on that one goal and that thing that you thought is is your life goal when there's so much more beyond that. And that's a really exciting thought. Mm. Yeah, totally. I mean, my last DJ gig was ADE 2019. Mm-hmm. And I remember, I mean, I it's one of the best gigs i've ever played and i remember feeling even during that gig i was like i'm loving it but i feel a bit limited Mm. like i feel a bit limited by this it's like if all i've got to say like is playing records one after the other like i'm not going to be satisfied because it's not enough of a creative outlet for me like the the container's not big enough for me to be able to express everything that I've got to express and be able to help the people that I'm here to help. Mm-hmm. And that's really part of the purpose for me. It's like try and help as many people as humanly possible and try and express myself as freely as possible. And I've recently, as I said, I've got to that point of thinking it might not be dance music, it might be other things. And in fact, it already is when I look at what I am doing. So yeah. that's totally fine, but you've got to get yourself to a level of acceptance of that and be able to kind of yeah. let go of things to an extent. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I totally agree. I, for because as I said at the beginning of the podcast, presenting was always like what I wanted to do since I was a little girl. Like that was my life goal. Um, and I actually put myself through a lot of anxiety over the last last few years um of you know thinking okay well maybe living in ibiza is really restricting me to be able to to take a next step or to work for bigger businesses or you know just do other things in presenting and i yeah i was i was getting myself quite worked up about it um and it's only really recently been going back to what we were saying before also about this is exactly where I need to be, where I've realized that this actually really is my happy place. I could, I love living where I am. I love the people that I work with. And okay, maybe the jobs or I love, absolutely love what I do right now, but maybe I am still missing a few jobs that, I, that still haven't come yet, but I trust that they will come when they need to. Mm. Um, but taking away that like an- anxious thought of, you know, God, I really need to hurry up and find this job or make sure that I get my name out there and be as present as I can as possible. Once you kind of let that go, it's like, you know what? I can't even be bothered with all of that. (laughs) (laughs) Because then I think to myself, okay, imagine that somebody called you up tomorrow and said to you, you've got a job at, let's say, BBC Radio 1, for example, how would I feel? Obviously, I would be very excited about it and I would, it would be absolutely an an incredible achievement. But then I think, okay, but then that's a massive change and we're gonna have to change a lot of things. I won't be able to live here. I won't be able to, you know, have the routine that I have. And these are the actual things I've realized that do make me really, really happy. And the rest is just an addition. It's just secondary, you know, so. I think sometimes that we just really focus on that one goal and think that that's where we need to get and that's my life goal and that's what I'm going to work for. But then when you look around you and kind of look at the journey you've come on and what you've done along the way, 
I think that's the I think that's like the beauty of it mm. and not just you know folk trying to get to that goal and work as hard as you can crazy hours just to get there yeah totally totally and, and that's the thing it's like that's what we espouse here at that NYT is like it's about quality over quantity yeah and it's about being able to create art for the sake of creating art and for no other reason not because it yeah. can get released on a big label or you know you can earn loads of money flying around the world or you know you can appear like a big deal or you know attractive to the uh, members of the opposite sex or whatever sex it is that you're into you know it, 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 it those things are not important and encouraging people to you know have the same level of value for their art that they have for themselves because mm-hmm. I think the art that you create, if you don't value it, that's a reflection of how much you don't value yourself. Yeah. And I'm kind of really trying to get to the center, the core of that with a lot of people that, you know, your art is an artifact. It's something you've yeah. created. It's a representation of yourself and you should value yeah. it as such. And that art should leave a legacy. Yeah. And I think that's a really deep and really important purpose that, I think the electronic music industry in particular has maybe lost sight of mm-hmm. a little bit because, you know, I'm a big believer in the the transformative power of electronic music. And I think we're going to need it now more than ever. Yeah. And I think it's a really, really important thing to, as we're in this enforced pause, you know, I do hope that people are going to start thinking about things in a slightly different way and start, thinking about what kind of impact they're going to have on people through the music that they write, the way they perform, the way they release music, the way they put events on, everything else. The way they are with other people. Oh, totally, totally, totally. Because we've all been through it, you know. It's like there's not one person who's been exempt from this, you know. You've had your struggles, I've had my struggles, certainly. You know, and we're we're the lucky ones. You know, we're the ones who have still got roofs over our heads, you know, we're not sick. Absolutely. You know, our families have been largely okay. And it's it's a yeah. really, really important thing to kind of sort of bear in mind. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird times, but it's also really special times. And I think, you know, we've, if we, if we pay attention and we kind of listen deeply enough, we're going to be able to learn a lot from this. And I know I already have. Yeah, I, I definitely have. It, it sounds strange, but for me personally, it's been one of the best years of my life. It has in um, in different, obviously not financially, definitely not. Um, but with everything else, it has definitely been a, a big year of change for me mm. um, that I needed. And I think it's the it's going to be like the base for for. The, my future really so yeah I've, got, I've definitely got a lot of good things out, yeah. of this, out of this year yeah it's about building solid foundations for what comes next foundations was the word i was looking for yeah <laughs> yeah exactly so i mean I, I asked i've asked a few people the same question but like you know i mean it's a difficult question to answer really that's one of the reasons why i'm asking it but you know when things do start to open up again i mean what what are you not expecting but are you expecting it to just like go back to normal straight away is it going to go crazy again i mean what do you think it's going to look like sort of six months to a year from now i think i think things are going to go very slowly i don't i can't obviously as you just said it's really really difficult to say but i can't see things just bouncing back to how they were before i think it's for a lot of people a lot of people have had this time to reflect to you know to grow and maybe people want different things when they go back you know i'm not sure it's really really hard um in terms of obviously like events and attending events that i think that's going to be a whole new different thing um i don't know can you just can you imagine yourself being in like dc10 surrounded by thousands of people right now because i just can't even it gives me an anxiety attack just thinking about exactly, it exactly exactly and i think that for a lot this will happen for for a lot of people because i feel the exact same way of course i miss listening to music and being surrounded by people and you know having that human interaction seeing people that that you don't normally get to see every single day 
But I definitely am not missing that, um, you know, being at a venue, being around so many people and everything being really rushed. And and I think a lot, I don't think a lot of people will miss that. So I think everything will be a, little, a lot more slow paced. Mm. Um, and hopefully I think people will be a little bit more mindful um, with the way that, that this industry goes, the way that people travel, how fast paced things are. Um, I think things will slow down a little bit, but in a healthy way. Mm. Like I don't think it's going to mean that, you know, the industry's in going to die or anything like that. I think, I think that it's going to be good for the industry. I think things are going to still be quite, it's going to take a while, but I think it's going to slowly, but surely create a more healthy environment. And, and a stronger industry. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I think it's going to present a lot of opportunities for talent that yeah. maybe have been overlooked in the past. I mean, I've been saying this since since the start of it, really, that I think when it does eventually come back, I think travel is still going to be really, really difficult. I think yeah, absolutely. there's going to be a lot of restrictions still. We're not going to be able to get together in the same numbers that we have done previously. So therefore, it yeah. puts the emphasis on local scenes local yeah. talent it'll go back yep. to like resident djs smaller venues more intimate um it'll probably Less, grow from there yeah exactly lower prices as well like we all know especially here in ibiza how expensive it is to get into a club mm. how expensive it is to, to have a bottle of water it's ridiculous it's it's totally totally been blown out of proportion yep. and and I think this will be a good time to kind of reset um, some of these these issues as well and kind of go back to basics a little bit. Mm. Um, it needed to happen. Yeah. It had to. People can't carry on paying them, especially after everything that we, that's gone on over the last couple of years. It can't, we, we can't. No. It's just it's not sustainable. And we were in danger even before the pandemic of pricing a whole generation out who yeah. were not even because it was going to be it was heading in the same direction in places like Croatia and stuff like that as well yeah exactly it's like you know there's an entire generation of young people who are going to represent the future of this music and this culture that are being priced out of the market so they're going off and doing different things so you know there definitely needs to be like you say that kind of that kind of that grand reset if you will Um, and I for one I'm really excited by it because as I say, you know, I've, I've spoken to like a couple of really big artists in the last year, even beforehand, and we were we were saying even then that the next five years is going to be about putting the real, true artists back on the stage, yeah. and that I think is going to be accelerated quite a lot. And I can also see the art of DJing change mm. quite dramatically. Where five years from now, maybe even three years from now. Like, it won't look like the way it's looked for the last two decades. In fact, it's already happening. You think of artists like Kink. Uh, there's a young Dutch guy we work with at NYT called Holt. He's literally building his own instruments and playing live wow. with them. Like, he's insane. He's like, imagine Stefan Bodzen, but 24 years old, Dutch, and it can build his own shit and is like performing it That's live incredible. he's he's just an absolute he's he's a g he's, he's a genius and he's and he's he's incredible halt h-o-l-l-t halt, H-O-L-L-T, um halt. is oh, yeah. is making big waves and you know you've you've got people like ben boma you know all those these people who are like a hybrid between a dj and a live artist and I've maybe even something else that's kind of yeah. a hybrid weird in between thing um, yeah, I- yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, as you said, it's going, definitely going to create um, more opportunities and a chance to to for us to see like new and different talent, you know. And it's not always going to be the same artists on lineups because, especially here, it was getting very repetitive. Like it was just always the same people. Whatever party you go to, oh, it's yeah. just the same DJ. Oh yeah, totally. And you know, I remember being there for not last year, the year before, twenty nineteen because I was there for, like, most of the season. Mm. And I, I was actually building NYT while I was on the island. It was yeah. kind of like a half retreat, half holiday, half working thing. And, uh, you know, 
remember looking at the billboards in clubs and it's like it's the same people every week and no one else is getting a look in yeah 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 absolutely absolutely and it doesn't give the chance for you know all of these very talented upcoming artists that there's just there's they're not showing them you know mm-hmm. it's just always the same it's just whoever sells tickets whoever's going to make the most money which obviously i get it's a business at the end of the day but there had to be there needs to be some kind of change because if this hadn't have happened i could guarantee that the lineups that were in ivita last year will probably more or less would be more or less the same this year with maybe a couple of different changes oh yeah that wasn't going to be much different oh yeah you know yeah. So, so yeah, it's hopefully gonna that'll be, be something different. It's going to be interesting, and uh, yeah, I think you're going to get some different destinations pop up. I mean, the, the hilarity yeah. of it is like, I've um, I'm, I'm I'm decent friends with Josh Butler. And, oh, I love Josh Butler. Oh, he's great. He's great, and you know, he's currently in the clubbing capital of the world, New Zealand. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know whether you saw his videos on Instagram that did the rounds no, in the last I couple of weeks. Though. I see he was in New Zealand. I, I wouldn't really look Well, did you realise he's actually from New Zealand? What? He's no He way. was born in New Zealand. So when it all kicked off, like, I'm, I'm going to get him on the podcast soon, hopefully. Yeah. And he, he was like, I uh, think I'm going to trade Warrington for Wellington. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? As I've been putting it, and like basically, he put these things up on his Instagram, and it was just like playing to full clubs, rammed people hanging off the ceiling, and it was like, oh, New Zealand's become the epicenter of dance music yeah. in the whole world yeah. right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's hope. I mean, there's, yeah, there's hope. It's like Tulum, there. there's loads of people over in Tulum at the moment, isn't there? Yeah, it's a bit dodgy over there, though, isn't it? I know. I saw. I think. <laughs> I don't think I'd, 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 prob- I'd probably go to Tulum if I brought if I was allowed to bring a hazmat suit with me. Might be a bit <laughs> hot at the rave, like might be a bit like late eighties, second summer of love, you know. <laughs> so, so it's like yeah. it's, it's so funny because like that's what we've been saying around Liverpool. It's like those ravers at the back end of the eighties. They actually had twenty twenty well predicted, didn't they? What they were wearing with the masks <laughs> and the gloves and the glow sticks and all that stuff. The hazmat suit, all that kind of vibe, but yeah, I no. wouldn't be, I wouldn't be heading over to Tulum or no. anywhere else Anything. like that. Like, no, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 again, like each to their own. You want to take the risk; it's up to you, you know, to each their own. But you know, yeah, I don't think I'll be going there anytime soon. No, no, I think <laughs> I'm the wrong side of forty for any of that business now. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so uh, just to sort of close off, talk to me about Hello Demo and what you're doing for those guys. Oh, I love Hello Demo and I love the team that I work with. That's one of my favorite things is just they're just all so, so lovely and we we um we all get on really well. So with Hello Demo, so I when I started with them, it was just supposed to be PR um, so just handling um, all of their press. And then I kind of have got into doing a bit more of, you know, content creation um, with Kata, who you also know, who is an absolute gem. Um, but no, it's been it's been really, really interesting. I have really learned a lot. And it's been nice to work with them kind of. I think when I started, I think I don't know if they'd kind if they'd been going for about a year already. So I started with them quite near the beginning. So it's been really nice to be on that journey Mm. um, and, you know, really build the platform, onboard new labels, onboard new artists. But it's a really exciting time because there's there's a lot coming up. Um, A lot of labels are starting to, you know, to to use the platform, a lot of uh, big artists as well. So we're all really, really excited and, you know, and, you know, working with you as well and bouncing back ideas for content. We've, I've met some really, really interesting and um, really great people along the way. Mm. So, yeah, it's been a lot of fun and, yeah, no, I'm really, really enjoying it. I'm so, I'm so happy that the opportunity came, came across for me to start working with them. Again, it was through, funnily enough, I hadn't even thought about this, but through Isra, who was the the same guy who I got the job through when I started working at Amnesia. Ah. He was the same. He connected the dots there as right, well. Right, yeah, I got you. Yeah. So, no, it's exciting times. There's locks coming up. And, 
um, just, you know, excited to get it out there as much as possible. Mm. I've been doing, um, I'm doing like one tomorrow as well, and I did one last week. Um, do you know Hector from Vatos Locos? I, I think I've heard of him, yeah. So Hector's a Mexican artist, mm -hmm. and he has um, a label called Vatos Locos. Um, so he has been doing a, uh, it's called VL Camp in, in Guadalajara, mm -hmm. Mexico. Um, so I've been talking, well, I did one last week and one tomorrow as well, like a short masterclass on Hello Demo and like presenting the platform to all the students and showing them how it works. And they were all blown away. Like, this is amazing. This is exactly what we needed. And, you know, it's just such a great platform to be able to, to, to collaborate with other artists and bounce back ideas from one another mm. and create groups. So they were all really, really excited um, about trying the platform. Um, so I'm excited to do that again with them tomorrow. Wicked. And it's just, yeah, it's going, it's going really well. Mm. It's yeah. fun time. Yeah, we're yeah. excited about it as well because, you know, as I've, I've been on record on a couple of occasions saying that I think it's a complete game changer. Yeah, it really yeah, is. Yeah, absolutely. It, absolutely. And I get more excited when I hear other people say like, <laughs> wow, because I'm not a producer and I don't have a label. Mm. So for me, it's like I see it. Obviously, I work for Hello Demo, so I know exactly how everything works and all of its functions. But I don't know how a label manager or an artist you know how they fit that in with their their workflow or their everyday how they use it every single day mm. so when i hear other people talk about it or i tell them they're like literally this has changed the way i work this is amazing this is a tool i've been waiting for so that makes me even more excited oh, to yeah. hear how other people go i'll tell you, know? you know and to be honest like from coming from someone like who has run a label as well as part of a team co-founder the label all of that that you just mentioned is a total disaster under normal circumstances <laughs> it's a complete shit show so what happens yeah. is, is that a lot of people's demos just don't get listened to because there's just this influx of either completely inappropriate music stuff that you know it might be yeah. good but it's not quite there and you end up just defaulting because we're human beings at the end of the day we default to the path of least resistance so we end up yeah. going around the artists that we already know and around our family and the, and the network that we've already got and then we end up signing music from our friends and again opportunities have been lost and talent that hasn't been you know mm. the, we're not finding not discovering new talent mm. so yeah it's come at a, a, it's a like obviously it's a, a perfect time as well with a lot of people at home producing getting creative um so yeah i think it's definitely going to be a big tool of the future yeah very much so very much so and obviously we've done one really successful remix contest with bushwhacker already which was mm. fantastic and some great results off the back of that and you know yes. we've got some really good ideas for some new content coming soon which we'll be announcing through all of our channels in the near future so keep we it have. keep it locked to the uh, the demon social media <laughs> yes 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 we'll be posting everything there no exactly exactly this has been an absolute delight as per usual as it is every time we speak katie it's been great to kind of get in the weeds with you for a couple of hours and go deep oh no so, likewise it's been lovely to chat I'm, I'm, apologies for the barking in the background <laughs> But it's been so, so lovely to chat with you as always. And um, I'm excited for everything that we do together in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, your podcast is going from strength to strength as well. So um, tell people where they can find that and where they can find you on various channels. So my podcast is called Can You Put Me On Guest List. Um, you can find that on Spotify, on uh, Apple Podcasts, on Google Podcasts, on Podbean, all of the usual podcasting platforms. Um, it's also on Mambo Radio every Wednesday at 10 p.m., well, 9 p.m. in the UK. Um, you can listen to that online. And if you would like to find me on Instagram, drop me a message. Um, you can find me at Katie, which is K-A-T-I-E, H-A-Y, K N I G H T. Sorry, that was really. Does it turn into a spelling bee at the end there? What was going on there? It's, 
It's sorry. It's so, it would be much easier if I just said what it is. It's Katie Hay Nine. There you go. There you go. Everything will be in the show notes anyway, so you didn't have to spell it. So. And then my, um, also my Hello Domo profile is also Katie Hay Knight. If anybody wants to send any music there or whatever, all my social links are in there as well. Wicked. That would just be much easier. So. Wicked. That's all good. <laughs> That's all good. Okay, nice one for that. And I'll see you soon. I'll see you soon. Thank you so much for having me. Catch new episodes of Beyond the Studio every single week on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you enjoy your podcasts.